Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, the blue speedball returns and brings some new friends for the ride in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Sonic, voiced by Ben Schwartz, is still adjusting to his new life on Earth, with Tom Wachowski and his wife Maddie, played by James Marsden and Tika Sumter respectively, and trying to prove himself as a hero by moonlighting his vigilante, Blue Justice. When Tom and Maddie leave for Hawaii to attend the wedding of her sister Rachel, played by Natasha Rothwell, to Randall, played by Shamar Moore, Sonic Sonic is attacked by Dr. Robotnik, played by Jim Carrey, who has escaped from the Mushroom Planet with the aid of vengeful Echidna warrior Knuckles, voiced by Idris Elba. But Sonic is saved by the arrival of Tails, voiced by Colleen O'Shaughnessy, and soon the pair must race to find the powerful Master Emerald before it falls into Robotnik and Knuckles' hands. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is of course the sequel to the 2020 video game adaptation, and pretty much everyone involved with that movie has returned for this follow-up, including animator turned director Jeff Fowler, who made his directorial debut with the first movie, and writers Pat Casey and Josh Miller. And the first Sonic movie almost feels like a bit of a comeback story, because when that initial trailer landed with that first design of Sonic, everybody made fun of it. Everybody was saying that that movie looked like it was absolutely terrible. And then they bumped the release date back a few months so they could totally redesign Sonic. And when they released the second trailer with the new design, pretty much everyone made a U-turn. And when the first film came out, I thought it was cute. Not great, but very likeable. And I think the things that it got right, it really succeeded at. Like Sonic, not just in his design, but in his personality, and Jim Carrey as Robotnik. And that last 20 minutes of the movie really showed what they could have done with the film in its entirety. My problem with the first Sonic movie is that it did feel very much like a generic live-action animated hybrid that just happened to have Sonic plugged into it, as seen by the fact that you have a character that can run as fast as he possibly can, and they put him in a road trip movie where he spends most of the film sat in a car. That, I think, shows how much the film didn't really take advantage of the character or his universe properly. But the film definitely was a huge success at the box office. It was one of the last big hits before everything went a bit topsy-turvy, so a sequel was inevitable. And I was actually really looking forward to the sequel because I thought if the first movie walked because it just had to set up the character, now it got that out of the way, it could really run. It could, to quote the meme, go fast. But the thing about Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is that, yes, it is an improvement on its predecessor, but not as much as I would have hoped. Probably the biggest thing you can say about Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is that it does actually feel a lot more like a Sonic movie this time out. It feels like something that was actually written with the character in mind and incorporates so much more from the video games, be it characters, props, or the general mythology. And that will probably please a lot of fans that were left somewhat cold by the first movie that had a very tentative approach to the source material, almost bordering on generic, at times, but because of the success of the first movie, it feels like the filmmakers have so much more confidence, and now they're trying to give all those things that the fans wanted to see, and as a result, the film feels so much bigger than its predecessor. It feels like the scope of the movie has expanded massively, especially because there is so much more location hopping and set pieces this time out. Everything feels a lot grander in scope. So we're jumping around from Siberia to Hawaii to a hidden island and back to Green Hills all over again. And I think that that's a really canny decision because in many ways, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 does actually feel like a video game in terms of its plotting. And I don't mean that in a negative way because all these various set pieces, they feel like individual stages that you would select and play on, and of course culminate in the big boss battle at the end, even down to details like the fact that there are several moments where characters get struck and they drop their power-ups. That's the most video gamey thing I've ever seen in a movie adaptation, and I kind of love that they actually put that in there. And the idea of making it a quest plot is also a very good example of making it feel more like a video game, because because there is something inherently episodic about that kind of plot and structure. And so leading into that aspect 
again shows that the creative team have taken on board at least some of the complaints of the first movie and try to rectify them and try to improve on what they've done the first time out. Of course, it does help they had a relatively strong foundation in the first place, especially when it came to Sonic himself. One of the more brilliant things about the first movie, at least in my opinion, is the characterization of Sonic, where they basically turned him into a hyperactive kid. They made him an audience surrogate, at least for the younger set, and I think that instantly resonated with them, because like them, he's got a bit of a short attention span, he's always up and raring to go, and he's kind of in the rush to be an adult. He wants to try and prove himself, but there's still so much more to learn, even if sometimes that frustrates him. And the sequel basically takes that and kind of runs with it, especially this idea that he wants to be a hero, that he wants to be respected for his powers and actually try and use them for good. And we see this right from the character's intro, where in Seattle, he's trying to moonlight as a vigilante called Blue Justice. And that whole initial introduction to Sonic in this movie actually works really well. That's a very funny set piece, especially because it does feel like it's kind of making fun of superhero conventions especially the fact that Sonic, while he does use his abilities, he's also completely reckless with them and doesn't really know what he's doing and thus causes as much destruction as he does actually saving the day. He needs to learn how to actually take on responsibility, that it's not about all the adulation that you get for doing a good thing, it's about actually taking charge and actually taking care of everyone around you, that doing the right thing thing is doing the right thing for everyone, not just for yourself. Basically, making Sonic into a team player, which he's going to have to be because he's joining up with Tails later in the movie. And so, those are kind of messages that I think that the target audience will take on board, and of course, that kind of links in with the whole idea of family that the first movie was kind of playing around with, because of course, Sonic is sort of an adopted child, at least in the Wachowski household. And of course it also helps that Ben Schwartz is back in the role of Sonic, and again he's throwing out quips left, right and centre. They don't always land, but sometimes when they do, they really hit well. One line that I particularly enjoyed is that at one point Sonic claims that Robotnik has him living in his head rent free. That was quite clever, I, I liked that. that. Someone has obviously been skimming off Twitter a little bit. And as I said, they make so much more use of Sonic and his abilities, especially when it comes to the big set piece moments. And I feel like you can see this, especially in terms of just the CGI in general, where because they didn't have to change the character model halfway through post-production like they did the first time around, that means they've got a locked character model that they can play around with and try to integrate into the live action elements further. So there are scenes in this movie where Sonic gets absolutely soaking wet, or he gets sand mixed in with his fur and quills, and in the climax, he gets covered in debris and mud, and Sonic, if he wants to prove himself as being a hero, he definitely takes his knocks over the course of the movie. Maybe a little bit too much so, actually, because there is a half hour of the film where it does feel like Sonic is either getting knocked out or losing consciousness constantly. I would have toned that down a little bit. But yeah, they really actually put Sonic through the ringer in this movie, far more than I would actually expect for a children's film. But while those are undeniably praises, they do come with caveats. As I mentioned, the film is a quest movie, but it feels like it underused utilizes that aspect in terms of execution. There is a sequence late into the film where they're going through a temple and of course it's filled with booby traps that Robotnik and Sonic have to navigate in their separate ways and I wanted the movie honestly to be more of that. More that kind of pseudo Indiana Jones riff but with a Sonic style which yeah that's not exactly new especially for children's films. The Door of the Explorer movie basically mined a lot of that a few years ago but even so I would have liked to have seen an actual more cat and mouse game between Sonic and Robotnik where they're each trying to solve clues and get to locations before each other whereas what actually happens in the movie is more Sonic goes somewhere and then Robotnik just uses 
use technology to triangulate Sonic's location. There's no kind of fun in that sort of approach, whereas I feel like if they're competing against each other more actively, they should have played that up. There is stretch of the movie where the quest element just falls completely into the background, particularly in the whole set piece with the Siberian bar, which is basically an attempt to try and replicate the barroom brawl from the first movie, which was one of its big standouts, especially that slow-mo, whereas this time it's more of an extended dance battle, which yeah, I know, it's for the kids, but it goes on a bit too long, really, and I would have liked to have seen a different set piece instead of something like that, even though there are quite a few good gags in that stretch of the movie, and some surprisingly dark ones, especially considering that the Siberians keep threatening to roast Sonic and Tails in the fireplace, but even so, that sequence definitely feels like a concession to the younger audience that left me as an older audience member some what cold, but then of course I have to remember I'm watching a children's film. Either way, I do think that the movie does have a lot of stretches where it doesn't quite focus in the way that it really should do, and that was kind of bugging me all throughout the first hour or so of the movie, because on the one hand, yes, it is doing all the stuff that Sonic fans wanted out of the first movie and throws all those in, but it also puts them alongside all the stuff from the first movie they brought back, which is pretty much everything, and the result does end up feeling quite uneven and quite crowded, especially because the movie cuts constantly between Sonic on his quest and the human characters in Hawaii, so the movie definitely feels very much like it doesn't know where its focus is supposed to be. Hint, it should really be on Sonic. So yes, like the first movie, the film's biggest Achilles heel is that pesky human cast. And you might think, given the setup of then going to a wedding in Hawaii, that that's basically an excuse to get them out of the way of Sonic and his buddies and give them a lot more focus this time, which it is... And it isn't, because the wedding stuff is a full-fledged subplot in its own right that becomes prominent later on, so the movie keeps cutting back towards it, and every time it does so, it mucks up the momentum of the movie. It basically halts it in its tracks, especially because... No one in the audience cares about any of this stuff. Not the older audience members that I presume all this material is meant to be targeted towards, and especially not the younger viewers who couldn't care less about these characters if they tried. And so this stuff all feels like it's basically filler material. It feels like stuff that's just kind of there to give the human cast members something to do, in addition to a nice vacation in Hawaii, which I'm sure they had a great time shooting all of this stuff. The problem is that the Hawaiian subplot is really bad, actually. Like, the way that that eventually pans out, all of it is completely wrong and misjudged. The implications of what happens at that wedding are unsettling, especially for something that's supposed to be in a family film. So, in that respect, it does feel like those elements are not as well considered. And this is not me saying that the human cast are terrible, because far from it, I quite like a lot of the human cast members. I think that James Marsden, in particular, is someone that I've really enjoyed for a long time now, and he's really underrated as a performer. The problem is that I don't think they know what to do with him in this movie. They set up this angle that he's a father figure to Sonic. That makes perfect sense. He's sort of the mentor figure. But if you're going to do that, actually integrate him into the plot of the movie, have him participate in the adventure, make him actually be someone that Sonic can turn to for advice. Rothwell, in particular, gets a massively expanded role this time out, and I just have to wonder, who asked for that in the first place? Because no one goes to a Sonic movie to see a five-minute Bridezilla action sequence with Natasha Rothwell, but that's exactly what happens in this movie. It's a whole stretch of the movie that will unite audiences where they're five or 25 and asking, where's Sonic in this Sonic movie? The film is 122 minutes long, it's just a shade over two hours, and I do think that's a little bit too long for a film that's intended a young audience. There is about 10 to 15 minutes that should be cut out of this movie, and I would squarely point at all of this stuff. Cut it, 
cut it, cut it. Either get rid of it entirely or cut it down to its bare minimum because right now it feels so awkward as a stretch of movie to just take the title character out for an extended period of time like this. It puts the human characters at the expense of what the audience actually wants to see. Of course, the biggest highlight among the live action cast is Jim Carrey as Robotnik in what may well be one of his final performances given the interviews he's been taking on the film's PR tour. But even so, the casting of Carrey in the first movie was genuinely inspired, especially because it taps further into that 90s nostalgia of Sonic's heyday. I gotta be honest here, Sonic isn't really my nostalgia. I was more of a Crash Bandicoot kind of kid, but Jim Carrey? I was obsessed with him as a kid. He was my childhood hero. So there is something really kind of nostalgic for me, seeing him on screen, basically back in rubber-faced manic mode like he is here, albeit with a little bit of a darker edge. I do think that Carrie is a bit more uneven in this outing, in that he spends a lot of his time either interacting with Knuckles, who is a CGI character that's going to be added in later, or just spending a lot of his time on green screens. And there are moments where Robotnik's cutouts into otherwise entirely animated set do look a little bit wobbly and janky. And I do think that kind of creeps into Carey's performance because I think he's a little bit less assured in this outing than he was in the first one. There are moments where Carey's ad-libbing does seem to falter somewhat, particularly one kind of cringy moment where he just starts flossing for absolutely no reason reason, I guess, for the kids, right? But the casting of Carey is also inspired and he's pretty much the only live action actor alive that can be cartoonish enough to stand toe to toe with his animated counterparts. That being said, his best moments are with the live action cast, especially with Stone who's brought back for the sequel. He's been hiding as a barista, waiting for Robotnik's return, and they definitely kind of play up that a bit more from the first movie, especially the idea that Stone is secretly in love with Robotnik, which I'm not not even sure that's subtext anymore. That's just straight up text, given that there's a moment where he's playing around with Robotnik's devices and doing dress up, and one of them is just Robotnik in a maid dress, I think. There is definitely a Smithers to Robotnik's Mr. Burns thing going on here. But Carrie actually has several scenes stolen right from under his nose by Idris Elba's Knuckles, of all people. They do a really great job of integrating the character into the movie, and I think that's partially because they actually make him into, on some level, a legitimate threat for Sonic in that he is someone that is driven by vengeance. He is a warrior. He comes from the Echidna tribe that have all been wiped out apart from him in their battle with the Owls, if you vaguely remember the backstory of the first movie. And so he blames Sonic for that. And he thinks of himself as the hero in his own story because in his mind, he's restoring all to his fallen tribe. He sees himself as a protector of the Emerald. That is what drives him to try and find it, not to exploit it in the same way the Robotnik does, but he's too oblivious to notice that in their dynamic. So basically Knuckles is kind of set up as almost a mirror image of Sonic in some way, in that he has a similar kind of perspective, but they come at it from two different angles. And so you have this kind of combination where he's pretty much all brawn, and no brain. And that's kind of where the humour in the character comes in, in that, yes, he does have powerful fists, but that's mostly all he has going for him, because otherwise he has no self-awareness whatsoever, and at times is completely clueless. And so when Robotnik takes advantage of that, that's kind of amusing, but there's also moments where just simple concepts go completely over his head. It's clear that what they actually took inspiration from in terms of his characterization is Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy. There's a lot of that in Knuckles in this movie, in basically kid film form, and I have no problems with that whatsoever, because Yes, they blatantly lifted it, but they've executed it really well, especially thanks to Idris Elba's performance, which is surprisingly committed. Elba is really intense in the voiceover, which makes the lines where Knuckles doesn't actually understand what's going on all the more funnier. Lines like, 
what is the baseball? And it's Elba's vocal performance that sells the character, kind of playing off some of the roles that he's done in the past, which is genuinely more than you would anticipate because he easily could have phoned this in for a paycheck, but he doesn't, and he makes the character work. Unfortunately, the other major character from the video games that they've integrated is a bit less successful in the translation. They bring in Tails, who is massively popular with the kids in the audience, but they don't really make the best use of him because immediately Tails falls into the sidekick realm in that he basically tags along with Sonic but doesn't get all that much in terms of personality. It's great they brought in Colleen O'Shaughnessy to reprise her role from the video games, especially because so often they just recast for the movie, you know, see her co-stars. But even so, they don't give her enough to do, especially because the character actually gets shuttled off screen for extended periods of time. This is particularly obvious, again, around the midway point where that character is knocked unconscious and is injured and drops out of the movie for a solid half hour or more. But like the title character, once the movie hits its stride, it's unstoppable. The last act in particular is very strong, a solid collection of beats and action set pieces that's really fun and enjoyable, exactly the same way as its predecessor was in the last 20 or 30 minutes. I feel like once these movies get rid of all the distractions, especially all that Hawaiian wedding stuff, once it gets all the gubbins out of its system and actually just gets down with being a Sonic movie, it does that job really well. I was solidly entertained throughout the entire last portion of this film, and in terms of video game adaptations, this is one of the best I've seen at translating the tone and feel of it. It really does feel like you're watching the video game come to life on screen, and I don't mean that derisively. And the action set pieces towards the end are surprisingly intense given the target audience, but I think that's because they genuinely put a sense of stakes and danger behind them, so you genuinely do get a little bit invested in it. So the last stretch of the movie is really consistently fun. I just wish these movies were much more of that. I wish that they always were hitting this, but even so, I think that the last portion of this movie is solid enough to make up for a lot of misgivings beforehand, especially for fans who are getting to see a lot of things that they probably wanted to see on screen in the first movie finally come to life. Now, I think in that respect, all ages will be entertained, be it young fans or older nostalgic viewers retreating back to a childhood property. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is better but it's still not quite great. It's good that they've incorporated more elements of the video game to make it feel more like what it's supposed to be adapting, and at certain moments, it does shine very brightly, especially towards the end, but there'll be moments that feel like the video game paired up with other moments that just completely whiff on screen. It's a really inconsistent experience to the point of frustration at times, and it does feel like for all the listening to complaints that certain problems with the first film are actually doubled down here, especially with regards to the human characters. I don't mind them having them in the film in the first place, but they need to find a use for them. Instead, they just take up space, and the movie is too long for its target audience. It is a little bit on the indulgent side and trying to do too much at the same time. I think if it just focuses on being a Sonic movie, that would make a truly great video game adaptation. So when they make that third film that they've already announced and teased during the credits, just follow the advice of Jeff Goldblum. Must go faster, must go faster. If you like this review, then you can buy me a chili dog at my Kofi page, or you can go fast at my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.